veterans, service personnel, general public. I'm happy that I can tell you a little bit about my experiences during World War II. They wanted me to speak about 20 minutes, so all I can say is fasten your seat belts, tighten them up tight, and we will go. <laughs> I went into the service May the 21st, 1943. Was shipped down to Camp Shelby, Mississippi to take my uh, basic training. Six weeks of basic training then was something that uh, you really had to be in pretty good shape to endure. But most of us, we came through the Depression. We were slim and pretty much fit uh, for the uh, program that they had planned for us. After the uh, uh, training at Camp Shelby, we were shipped up to a place north of Boston called Camp Miles Standish. This was a staging area to go either to the Pacific or either to the ET ETO theater. You could tell the day before which way you were going. If you got khakis, you was going to the Pacific. If you got regular old wolves, you was going to the uh, European theater. We were, I'll say, fortunate going to the European theater. We, we boarded a ship called the Britannica at Boston Harbor. The ship during normal peacetime carried 25 passengers. They crammed 7,000 of us on board that ship, which was almost standing room only. And this was in January of 44. They also told us, they gave us a life preserver, but they told us that uh, the route that we were gonna take that if the ship was sunk, they did not have enough lifeboats to take care of all the 7,000, and that most of us would be in the water. And our life expectancy in that water was about five minutes. But uh, fortunately, I was one of the ones that uh, could not take the sea. I was seasick from just about the time I stepped on that ship until I stepped off in Liverpool. So I spent most of my time looking at the water over the side of the boat. And uh, we went up close to Iceland and Greenland and uh, down through that area. They told us this was supposedly one of the largest convoys that had crossed the Atlantic. We were the fastest ship and we were in the rear. They had a bunch of World War I uh, destroyers which was escorting us across the Atlantic. And they. They said, if your ship has to drop out, you'll get no protection from the destroyers. They will not wait around with you. And back then, they did not ship the males and females mixed. They kept them separated. And it was one ship load of uh, wax <clears throat> that was going over that their ship had engine problems. I don't know this to be a fact, but we were told that uh, a German submarine got them before they ever had a chance to get into the war. We landed at uh, Liverpool, England and boarded a train. These little dinky trains, which we were not used to, the cars from what we were used to here in the U.S. Uh, late in the evening and down through the countryside from Liverpool all the way to Plymouth, England. Once we got to Plymouth, England, we d did not expect the greetings that we got, but the Germans were just across the uh, channel from us, and so almost every night they would delight in disturbing our sleep. And we would get in our foxholes, and if a 500-pound bomb dropped within, I'll say, maybe 100 yards of you, it would bounce you out of that foxhole like you had springs on the bottom of your feet. I figured I would eliminate that, so I spread my arms out. I decided I wasn't going to come out of that foxhole. I came out of there and left part of my hide on my arms inside that foxhole. So I decided just to ride with the, with the tide in those uh, conditions. We trained very intensely down there, going out 
and coming in on the shore would have uh, troops there acting like our enemies to try to uh, protect uh, the, the territory. And about three weeks before D-Day, a practice was going on and there was a National Guard unit from Kansas that they were all well known to each other, brothers, brother-in-laws, and a couple of, of the German PT boats, similar to the ones that Kennedy commanded, got in amongst those LSTs and sank three of them with the loss of 700 lives. Now they swore us to secrecy that we would not talk about that for, they did not give us any length of time, but I know about seven or eight years ago, maybe a little longer, I was talking to a school class and that came across my mind. And I told them about this and I told them that we were sworn to secrecy. But I said, if they come and arrest me, at least they've got to feed me and clothe me for the rest of my life so it wouldn't be too bad one way or the other. But then when I got home and was looking at the TV, the British over on the beach was putting up a monument for those 700 GIs that were drowned out there in the uh, channel. And then I picked up my paper and their hometown was given a celebration for them, recognizing them in their hometown. We did not know when we were going to board an LST or whatever. There was 275 persons in our company. It was a heavy maintenance uh, ordnance company. Now we were trained to maintain anything from a pocket watch to a tank. That included all types of guns, vehicles, jeeps, three quarters, whatever. But uh, they put us in what they call staging areas down on the coast. We traveled from uh, Southampton all the way down to past Torquay there on the coast from time to time. They did not let us stay put very long because the Germans would try to concentrate, find out where the concentration was, and that's where they'd try to do their bombing. But they would do their bombing at night. They didn't try it in the daytime very much because of the protection that we had from our uh, Air Force. So eventually we knew, we were not told, but we felt like that the invasion was getting close because our training was getting more intense every day. So finally one day our CO told us we're going to a staging area and we knew that that was the jumping off point once we got to this staging area. And once you entered that staging area, the only way you was going to get out of there was, was uh, as a dead man. They would not let you out of there. I don't care what happened. You stayed in that staging area. And when they got ready to get you out of that staging area, the MPs escorted you to wherever you were going to board the, the ship. It took three LSTs to take care of our company because we had many types of uh, special vehicles to maintain the uh, equipment that the Army had. And I went over on 419. That was the first, we went over behind the 4th Infantry Division which spearheaded the drive on uh, Utah Beach. Now, before the landings early that morning, the 101st and the 82nd Division jumped behind us. And they were supposed to protect the us from the Germans bringing up any type of uh, uh, reinforcements. But our intelligence failed to recognize that the Germans had put more anti-aircraft fire in those areas that they were going to have to fly over than what the pilots knew. Well, when they got in there, they began to just weave around, trying to get around that fire, and eventually they became lost. And they just told them, says, uh, bail out and so they turned the light on and they bailed out they only had a map for about five miles of where they were to, to actually land well they all had or started out with a snapper and when they landed they didn't know where to look for the other part of their 
comrades. So they would, and they would wait and listen. If they heard a noise out there and they didn't get a, they knew they had an enemy out there. So they could get ready to fight rather than join up with them. But they did a, a fine job protecting us with what they had left after they got on the ground. But uh, once we got on the beach, of course it was noise. In fact, when we were going in, the bodies from the 4th Infantry, our LST was pushing them from side to side out of the water there. There also was something that you will not find the Navy will take credit for. At, uh, it was a good thing, but a cruel looking thing. They had three guys in a boat that was probably about, I'm gonna say 16 feet long. One of them was from the grave department, one of them was a helmsman, and the other one had a 30 caliber machine gun. And a body, they would pull up to this body. One guy would clip the dog tags off of it, and the other one would shoot with 30 caliber lead until he sank. Sounds cruel, but you couldn't afford to let those bodies get in on the shore and deteriorate and cause more uh, disease than uh, what we could deal with. But once we hit the beach, you have not heard any noise like that from, some of it was from some our people, some of it was from the Germans. But I described I had three modes that I went through. One, I, first I was afraid, then I was scared, and then I was numb. I just moved on except whatever happened to me. And we finally got our way up into the uh, edge of the beach there, and we just dug in, and we was right at the edge of the hedgerows. Now, anybody that has not seen those hedgerows, they do not know what a thicket is like. But it took us six weeks to fight our way past those thickets because the Germans would get on the back side of them and this was just a narrow road that went through those uh, hedgerows. And we could not, when we tried to go through there with a the tank, by the time the tank got through there, they were all set up with their 88 and they'd blow it all to pieces. And by the way, that 88 was the best gun that was in World War II. They, the Germans used it for everything. They used it for any aircraft, they used it for artillery, they had it on their tanks. Any place they wanted to use a, a gun, they used that 88, which was, you know, hard to say, but it was the best. And uh, once uh, from, uh, we got through the hedgerow, but from June the 6th to September the 11th, we had 40,000 killed, 20,000 missing, and 140,000 wounded. Now you heard Brokoff tell what, how many that was killed uh, further along the way. But even that was uh, a bad situation. So we, we were in with the Third Army, General George S. Patton, a glory hunter, blood and guts. Your, his his uh, guts and your blood. <laughs> and uh, we moved on through uh, to Metz. And the Germans stopped us at Metz. And the Eisenhower called a meeting of the three generals to see what the plan should be to minimize the loss and get through Metz. Well, first thing, Patton got up and says, uh, give me enough do uh, six by sixes to haul the dog tags back in and says, I'll put you through Metz, which he didn't care how many was killed, just give him the men and he'd finally get through there, which I agree. He could probably do that, but Eisenhower didn't accept that plan. Well, about that time <clears throat> was when the Germans started their attack on uh, Bastogne, and the winter had set in. And I have never suffered through a winter that was as cold and bitter as that winter was. And anybody that was in that area at that time will tell you the same thing. Uh, I carried a, an extra pair of socks around my waist, and when my feet got wet, 
I changed those socks out and put the other around my waist to warm them up so that I, my feet would not uh, become infected. And during the Battle of the Bulls, uh, the uh, statistics say that uh, there was more casualties from frostbite and feet than there were from the German attack. Now the snow, we, we stayed in the ditches more than we stayed on the road because it had begun after we left Metz. It had begun to snow and rain and freezing rain and sleet for, and it didn't let up. It just kept coming down. I, I'm going to guess there's probably six or eight inches of it on the roads. And you try to move equipment, it's hard to move it very fast on a situation like that. But eventually, uh, the weather broke at Bastogne and was able to get the uh, aircraft in to do some strafing and bombing. But the Germans uh, liked to get us into the forest, like uh, where they're taking fire artillery shells and it didn't make any difference what if it, it hit you they just want to hit the trees because the splintering from those trees would do just as much damage as a shell would in fact more so but uh, after the clearing and the planes began to get to the German tanks and uh, then the bombers began to uh, cut off all their reserves trying to come up Hitler thought that once he got Bastogne, then he would move up to Antwerp and cut off the uh, uh, port up there that we were using also for uh, bringing in equipment. And he thought that would probably give them an advance to uh, uh, get pushed back the American troops. But I don't think that there were many, if any, of the American troops had anything on their mind, but they're going to win that war. I know when they went in on the beach, there was a lot of them that uh, never, never even got to the beach. But the ones behind them saw them fall, but they didn't stop. They kept going. And the uh, thing that I would like to say today is that freedom is not free. Somebody pays the price. I feel like that I spent three years I won't say wasted because I look at the people here today that have progressed uh, from the time that me and 16 and a half other people, 16 and a half million other people put in and this gave them a chance to live their dream that they wanted to live. After the Battle of the Bulge, I suppose that they thought that the war was beginning to wind down but they sent my outfit, the 546, down to Marseille, France. <clears throat> we were going directly to the Pacific. There was a many others, other troops in that same place. They were going to go by the States, get additional training, get leave at home. But we were going direct, which they were estimating that there would be over a million casualties. Now, we thought, you know, we had fought our war, we had won our war. We didn't understand what the generals had planned in the beginning of how this war would be fought. We only saw our little bit of the war. But uh, after the second bomb was dropped, they sent us back to uh, up northern France. Now they had staging areas up there again to ship us home with, and all those were named after cigarettes like Lucky Stripe, Philip Morris and all of the cigarettes. And of course, they, I got a Liberty ship coming back. 14 days, same old thing, 14 days sick again. And finally got back to the States. And uh, Ms. Ambins read part of my history after that. But here just a few weeks ago, the uh, French government uh, asked me to come up to Nashville and they awarded me another medal of the Legion of Honor. And uh, Bill Varnado, he had received that earlier, but he had to go to Atlanta for his. And 
I had to go to uh, uh, Nashville for mine. But uh, I want to thank you all for your time and attention and hope that I have given you a little bit of my experience. And mine is true. You can read a lot of books. I disagree a little bit with Brokoff on some of the things there, but I'm not going to dispute them. I'll just tell you what my insight was on it. But uh, thank you very much. And hope you've enjoyed it. Mr. McMurrin has agreed to take a few questions today, but before we start that, I want to let you know that he is not the only World War II veteran among us today. We are very honored, and if, you, if I mispronounce your name, please forgive me, but we have Earl Calvin, El, Earl Calvin Duell here. You raise your hand, sir. <laughs> Albert Fowler. Bill Howard, Robert Jeffrey, Howard Poland. Verdery Robertson. <laughs> William Rose. <laughs> and Bill Varnado. And Mr. Wold, Bill Wold. Oh. And Russell Curl, thank you, I'm sorry. And I know we have a number of other military veterans here with us and also active duty. I saw a few uniforms and so we can't thank you enough for your service. Mr. Uh, if, does anyone have any questions for Mr. McMurrin? Yeah, maybe you answered them all. <laughs> How old were you when you landed on the beach? Nineteen. My birthday is June the 10th, and I only had about four days to go. I only had about four days to go before I was having a birthday, but I didn't... I didn't realize I had a birthday. I didn't like that birthday present anyway. <laughs> there was one other thing I would like to mention during that uh, winter and the battles that was going on. I do not remember the Christmas of uh, 1944. I know that I had turkey because Eisenhower had prefer, uh, promised all the GIs turkey and I have a letter that I had written to my mother and told her that I had turkey that day, but I don't remember anything about it. <laughs> what did you eat while you were in the military? He asked what you ate while you were in the military. What my, what my pay was? No, what you ate besides your turkey on Christmas Day. Oh, well, when we had uh, C rations, K rations, and sometimes we would have a hot meal. Now, once upon a time when we were moving up, uh, we stopped at this uh, kitchen, and the best thing they had was mashed potatoes. And I was hungry, so I took a real good helping of mashed potatoes. Well, that evening I became ill. I had diarrhea and nausea. <laughs> Went back to see the doctor, got my first sergeant to take me back. There was one doctor back behind we knew about. He said he didn't have any way to test to see what was wrong with me. So they sent me back to something like a MASH hospital. And the doctor just took a 
swab and run in my mouth and came back in a few minutes and says, where did you get this arsenic? I says, I don't know. He said, well, where did you eat? And I told him, and he says, yeah. He said, we'll have to take care of that. He says, we got German, German KPs there. They had them helping with the mess hall and everything. I spent a week in the hospital, but it was a French hospital, and the bombers had gotten there earlier, and there wasn't a window in that hospital. That uh, So some of the medicine that they tried to give me, I would toss out the window. I didn't bother about <laughs> taking it. But that was one thing that did not get on my service record that I was in the hospital for a week. One um, Did you have any friends that were shipped into the war killed? He asked if you had any friends who were killed during the war. Sure. We had a something that's, I don't know if it still exists, but we had buddies. And our buddy would lay his life down for us, and we would do the same for him. Did you ever get to go home? I mean, while he was, during the time that he was in service, did you get to go home during the time that you were serving oh, no. in World War II? No. We did not have any R&R &R either when we were... Once we hit the beach, we spent approximately nine months, at least our company did, on the move. We didn't have any spare time for anything. We'll take a couple of more questions. Were a lot of men killed by these rifles that click twice after you click your um, cricket once? I think you need to explain your cricket again. He thought you meant a, those were a rifle. Can you show it to him? Yeah, it's, uh, this is something that they picked up. We had these when we were kids. We'd get out and month, several of us just to hear them pop. And they put them to use for signals during the, uh, after the paratroopers landed, which was a good thing. Yeah, question about the hedgerows. Why were the planners surprised and why didn't they anticipate how difficult it would be to push through the, head row, the hedgerows? I don't think that they realized how thick those hedgerows were. It was poor planning, I'll guarantee you, but have you ever looked at the logistics on everything that, that they did, how they got all the troops in, all the ammunition, all the trucks, didn't have any computers or anything like that. It all had to be done by hand. But the logistics of that operation just boggles my mind. How long were you out there? Um, in Normandy. How long were you at Normandy? Well, I'm going to guess about uh, four or five months. It's pretty hard to tell where the line of Normandy be uh, stops and northern France begins. I was wondering if you could share with us uh, uh, the most memorable, memorable event of the war for you. Well, I guess, the I guess the most memorable event was stepping off that LST on the, the beach there and all the noise and everything that was going on. You didn't know where it was coming from or going to. There was no, I'll say there was no pleasant things that went on from the time we hit the beach until after the Battle of the Bulge. Well, Mr. McMurrin, we cannot thank you enough for your talk today. Um, I know you didn't think you were going to make it off that beach to see that 20th birthday <laughs> 70 years ago, and we know that you're about to have a significant birthday this coming Tuesday. Hi. So would you all join me in send, uh, singing Mr. McMurrin, Harold McMurrin, a happy 90th birthday. Somebody who can sing needs to start. <laughs>